Okay, here we are to yet another video. They're in the final two questions of October 2023 at Excel International A Level for Physics Unit 4. So, question 21 is about uh, particle physics. So, pions are created in the upper atmosphere when high energy cosmic rays interact with nuclei in the atmosphere. Pions are mesons. Okay, now you need to know what mesons are. Mesons are quark, anti-quark compositions. They don't last for long because they're not that stable. And they quickly decay to muons. Muons, as it says, are leptons with a mass of 106 mega electron volt units. Okay, we put the C squared to show that we're talking about mass because if you remember, the equation that it comes from is E equals mc squared, but instead of using joules, we're using electron volt units, which are more appropriate for small particles. Give a possible quark structure of a pion. Well, I've already told you that a pion, it tells you is a meson, that means it must have a quark and an anti-quark composition. So anything you put which has a quark, anti-quark composition, you will get a mark for. So, for example, it says it could be an up, anti-down, okay? It could be, so that will give you a mark. You only put one. Don't put more than one. They'll take your first answer if you give more than one. It could be a down, anti-up, because that's still a quark, anti-quark composition. Remember, the bar above the, the letter shows as an anti-particle, okay? You could do upper, up, anti-up, and you could have down, anti-down, okay? So you need to know that a pion is an up-down combination. That will give you one mark. So just choose one, put whichever one you want to do first. The equation shows a pion decaying into a muon and an antineutrino. So this is a continuation of the story from a. So the pion is pi minus, so now we know it must be a quark composition which will allow it to be a negative combination. Okay. A muon, which is a lepton, that means it's a bit like an electron, yeah, and it produces an antineutrino at the same time. Okay. So don't get confused with the bar, it's not negative this time. It's a bar above the uh, new, which is for the neutrino. This is a, looks like a V. It should really be more curled. Okay, And the reason they put a muon there is that it always gets created when the muon gets created. So it's an anti-muon neutrino. Okay, Energy and momentum must always be conserved in this decay. So we're not, they're just telling you that as a fact explain two other conservation laws that apply to that must apply to this decay. Well, the ones you should be looking at are charge, Q, and lepton number, because we have leptons. We don't have any baryons, so there's no point in doing the baryon com combination. So on the left-hand side, so of this arrow, we've got a pi. So in terms of Q, the the Charge is negative before the arrow, yeah? So I'm looking at charge only. Q is minus 1. Mu is minus 1. And the neutrino is neutral, has no charge, okay? So that means charge is conserved. Okay? You will get... Um, one mark for choosing to analyze it this way, minus one on the left, minus one total on the right, and for showing this way you'll get two marks, okay? So if you've got your numbers right um, and you've done the conservation charge, that's worth two marks. The lepton numbers, you do exactly the same. Well, is a pion a lepton? No, it's a quark composition. Leptons are not made of quarks. So the lepton number on the left must be zero. A muon is a lepton, yeah? 
and its lepton number is plus one. Why is it plus one? It's nothing to do with the charge. It's to do with the fact that it's a lepton and there is no, it's not an anti-lepton. Okay, so remember anti-leptons will be minus one. Now here, the neutrino is also a lepton. It always gets created with either an electron or a muon or any other lepton that is produced. So when you produce a muon or a lepton, you must also produce an anti-lepton. So the answer here should be plus minus one. Sometimes it's handy putting them in brackets. So you see zero on the left, no leptons on the left. You've cancelled the lepton numbers on the right. So lepton are conserved. Okay, so as long as you got the numbers right, a plus one and a minus one, you'll get the second mark. And for saying leptons are conserved. So very easy four marks. They actually probably would give you a mark if you missed out one of these and did the baryon number in the same. It should be zero to zero to zero. But I'm not going to show that, but baryons, because none of them are baryons, it would be zero to zero to zero. And you could say baryon numbers are also conserved. So this is a possible interaction which does, doesn't break any of the rules. Okay. Now, going on to part C. It now wants you to use the information given. Now, we've given the mass in mega electron volts. The C squared just shows that we're dealing with mass. Yeah, because m is equal to energy divided by c squared. That's why it's slash c squared. So as long as you've got the energy over the c squared, it's just showing you that you need to uh, realize that these units are alternative to joules. Calculate the mass in kilograms. Well, to do that, first the method you use is convert the energy from mega electron volts into joules. And all you've got to do is you multiply the mega electron volts by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Okay, that's the only thing you need to know. Once you do that, yeah, you will get, so the energy will be equal to Q times V. There's the way the 1.69, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 comes in. So it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 multiplied by the mega electron volts, which is 106 times 10 to the 6 for mega. When you do that, the energy conversion is 1.7, 0. Okay, you can have three significant figures. They're given us 106 Ti uh, times 10 to the minus 11 joules. And that's where you can see we don't use joules normally for such small particles. So it's a very smart, a tiny amount or in energy in joules. Once you got that, you can then use E equals MC squared. Yeah, you convert, so it's M equals E over C squared using Einstein's equation. So you put your answer 1.70 times 10 to the minus 11 divided by 9 times 10 to the 16, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. Yeah, and that will give you your answer in mass in kilograms, 1.88 times 10 to the minus 28 kg. And there, they've even given you that the units are in kg, so you don't get a mark for the units, you just get a mark for doing the conversion. So the one for knowing that you've got to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, one for getting the answer, uh, one for getting the use of this equation actually. So it's actually two marks for uh, this. Anyway, if you've done all three, you get the three marks. Okay, the next part of this question is to do with relativity. It reads, when at rest, pions have an average lifetime of 26 nanoseconds. This is meant to be 10 to the minus 9 here, to make sure you know that nano is 10 to the minus 9. When produced in the upper atmosphere, high energy pions have a speed of up to 0.99 c, which means 99% the speed of light. So, there's the scenario. Explain how the average lifetime 
of these high energy pions compares with the lifetime of pions which are at rest, so they're not moving fast. Okay, you do not need to carry out any calculations. So this is about um, relativity. Now you should know that when you get to relativistic speeds, that means speeds close to the speed of light, then physics uh, changes. And for example, the time you experience, if you want to know the mathematics involved, here's my notes for you. There's no harm knowing a little bit more than your syllabus requires you to. So time dilation at relativistic speeds becomes significant. Yes, that's what you've got to say. So you've got to say relativistic effects will be significant at such high speeds. Yeah? So, time dilation occurs. Yeah? And the lifetime, if you could do the maths using the equation below, of these high energy would be longer than for pions at rest. Okay? So you get one mark for realizing the time dilation occurs because of relativistic effects and one mark for realizing that the lifetime will be longer. Okay? So if you travel fast, you live longer. Okay, next question. Question 22, the final question in this paper, so hopefully we can get through it as quickly as possible. The electron beam tube. Now, this is something that physics labs sometimes have. Uh, we don't actually have one in, in my current school, but most of the places I've worked at have had them before. And you need to know how they work, so it will be worth watching a video on it if you haven't seen one um, in reality. So the electron beam tube can be used to determine the specific charge, which means the electron charge divided by the mass, yes, of an electron. Okay, the potential difference. This is the basic working of it of how they um, are produced. You get a beam of electrons. A potential difference v is applied where I'm showing you in the arrow. So here, an electron potential difference is used between the anode and the cathode. It's called thermionic emission, which you also need to know about. So this is thermionic, means with temperature, hot filament gets hot, electrons escape the surface of the metal, and they're attracted to the anode. It's applied between the cathode and the anode to produce a beam of electrons. Yes, sometimes also called an electron gun. Now, they, the, the anode has a hole in the middle of it, so when the electrons are attracted to it, a lot of them will hit the anode and just be absorbed, and some of them will go through the hole and come out as a beam, which can become visible because you've got a fluorescent screen. You have to have a vacuum, otherwise the electrons will be absorbed. Okay, so that's basically the working of the first part of the question, which is thermionic emission and acceleration of electrons into a beam. The beam is aimed at a fluorescent screen, which I just mentioned, inside the tube, the evacuated tube, vacuum, and the path of the electrons is seen, it's made visible by the fluorescence of the screen um, on the screen. So you can actually see it often it's like a pale blue, a turquoisey blue uh, color. Okay, the ones that I've seen are anyway. So then it says there are two parallel metal plates above and below the screen, here and here, attached to A and B, where you can put connections to a high voltage supply. Okay, A and B are connected to these plates and allow a potential difference to be applied across the plates. Well obviously that will produce an electric field 
like we had in a previous question with the par parallel plates. So you've got an electric field between A and B, which the strength of the electric field is the voltage applied divided by the separation of the plates. Okay, so it's using electric field theory. Okay, it says explain why electrons are deflected into a parab parabolic path, which basically means a curve when a potential difference is applied between A and B. Well, since they're electrons, if you put A as positive, B as negative, or the parabolic, the parabolic path will be upwards, a deflection. And if it was A at B was positive, you could deflect them downwards. Okay. So explain why electrons are deflected when a potential difference is applied between A and B. Well, hint, there are two components to motion, horizontal and vertical. It's a bit like projectile motion in mechanics. Okay, so how do you answer this question? It's a three marker. So these are what you should look for. The point that you need to make. There is a resultant force on the electrons in the, di in the direction, uh, in the vertical direction. So because the plates are up and down, if the positive plate is at the top, so say the plate becomes positive at the top because of the voltage you put, then the electron beam will deflect upwards. There's nothing wrong with drawing a diagram on the upper, on the di uh, that you show. So because of that, that's the first mark. So the electrons are accelerated vertically. Okay, so first point you need to make is that there is a resultant force Vertically, I put it upwards. As long as you finish your thought there and you are making sure that the examiner understands what you've written. So electrons are, ex are accelerated vertically. Yeah, that means that horizontally they continue moving with the same velocity. So horizontal motion continues at constant speed. So horizontally they're not going any different. Vertically, they are accelerated, so that's why they start to uh, move upwards. Okay, that explains the three marks. So you get basically one for understanding there's a resultant force vertically, one for saying that that's Newton's second law, they're going to be accelerated vertically by F equals QE, and uh, horizontal motion remains the same, so they continue to move forwards. Okay, the next part of the question is a continuation of the same subject. A potential difference of 850 volts, it says, is applied between the cathode and the anode. So this is to produce the beam of electrons. Okay, it's not between the plates A and B. Make sure you're reading the questions carefully. It's between the cathode and the anode. So 850 volts is going to accelerate the electrons uh, from the standing start of after thermionic being emitted from the heater. Show that the maximum speed of the electrons as they emerge from the anode is about 1.7 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Okay, so basically what's happening is you are providing the energy by way of Q times V, energy, is charge times voltage. This is a known equation. You need to know how to do that. Accelerates the, acceler, accelerates the electrons, so they gain in velocity, therefore they gain in kinetic energy. So what you've got to do is you've got to equate this equation with kinetic energy, okay? And then you can find V. So half mv squared, m is the mass of the electrons, which is given to you in your data sheet, is equal to charge of the electrons, just to put it, call that E, times voltage, okay? That means V squared is going to be equal to 2 E V over M 
which is 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, the electron charge, multiplied by 850, the voltage we've given it, divided by the mass of the electron from your data sheet, and uh, I always remember it as 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Yes, once you do that, you can cross off this, uh, the square here, put the square root sign there, and you can put it directly into your calculator, and you will get the velocity of 1.73 times 10 to the 7 meters per second, which uh, is approximately equal to 1.7 times 10 to the 7 meters per second, which is what they were asking for in the question. Always show that the maximum speed is about 1.7. Okay? The next part of the question. I hope that makes sense. The electric field strength between the plates. So now we're doing the parallel plates A and B in the diagram on the page. So putting an electric field between A and B. Okay? So the electric field strength between the parallel plates is 1.7 times 10 to the 4 volts per meter. Now remember that means if we know the separation of the plates, we can also know the electric field strength. The length of each plate is 7.5 centimeters. That's the length of each plate, not the distance between them. The electrons pass through the region between the metal plates. So in other words, the width of the electric field which deflects the electrons is 7.5 centimeters. That's for how long the electric field can act um, on the electrons. Calculate the vertical deflection of the electron beam. You should ignore the weight of the electrons because obviously gravity would also pull the electrons down, but it's negligible compared to the electric field strength. Gravity is a very weak force compared to an electric field force. Remember what I told you before, and we did it in the earlier question, F equals QE. Yeah, the region is the electric field, which is also this equation, to deflect the electrons vertically. F must also equal MA, and then we can determine A. This allows you to find the time of travel, the 7.5 centimeters, in the electric field, using that, that if it's, um, the distance is S horizontally, yeah, it's equal to the horizontal speed times the time taken. So we can work out the what UH from the V in this question. So we know that the V is 1.73 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. It allows us to work out the time. Okay, so as long as you know the how to use this equation and relate it to the answer from the previous question, which is the velocity of the electrons, you can then work out um, the time. So if you can use that to work out time, you get one mark. Yeah? So I've done that twice. Then you use your F equals QE. Yeah? And you'll be able to work out the value for F equals QE because we've been given the electric field strength. So you can work out D, um, which I don't think you need to. Here, it allows you to work out that S, horizontally, is equal to we need to first get, I think before we do that, we need to get the force F equals QE. So, time Oh yes, for this you can work out the time is equal to 7.5, the distance given between the plates, uh, that travels between the length of the plates, 7.5 to 10 to the minus 2, that's the centimetres, and divide that by the horizontal speed, 
which we worked out before was 1.73 this is from part 1 above times 10 to the 7 that allows you to come up with a time of this tiny very small time it only goes for nanoseconds times 10 to the minus 9 seconds so you get one mark for working out the time then you have to work out the f the force size the force which is QE E is given to us as 1.7 times 10 to the 4 volts per meter. Multiply that by the charge of the electron and you will get an answer of 2.72 vertical force times 10 to the power of minus 15 newtons always working very small numbers for an electron. So that's the electron charge that's the electric field strength, and that's how you determine the force. You then want to work out the acceleration upwards as F, from this of what you just worked out, divided by the mass of the electron. So you put that number in, so the one you just worked out, 2.72 times 10 to the power of minus 15, divided by 9.11 mass of the electron from your data sheet, times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms give you an acceleration of 2.99 and it's a big number this time because it's such a small mass it's times 10 to the 15 rate of acceleration meters per second squared and of course this acceleration only lasts for 10 to the minus 9 seconds once you know the acceleration you can use as I've written down in my note, S equals UT plus half AT vertically to work out the deflection in S. And that's what they want you to work out, the vertical deflection. So S equals UT vertically, it was zero, the vertical speed initially. So all you've got to do is multiply by half A, which comes from here, times 2.99 times 10 to the 15, times t squared, that means the factor of, na of nanoseconds comes in twice because you're squaring it. And that is a horizontal deflection of 0 0.028 meters, which is 2.8 centimeters, and that's what they ask you to work out, the vertical deflection. Okay? So you can leave your answer in meters, you don't need to change it into centimeters. Okay, now we've already made a very long video, but we will just have to finish off because there's only one question left, one part of this question, in fact. Part three, the electric field between the parallel plates is removed. So if you remove the electric field, it should just go in a straight line, but then a uniform magnetic field is applied to deflect the electrons into a circular path of radius 3.5. Now, this takes you to the equation for circular motion, which is a, mag is a circular path, so it tells you circular motion applies, which is the beginning of unit 4. mv squared over r must equal to, b, equal to bqv, and this is the equation for the force in a magnetic field on a charged particle. Uh, given the magnetic field density, flux density is 3 milliteslas, so the b comes from above, the Q we know is an electron, and they want you to assess whether this gives a value for E to M in agreement with the standard value. Well, how do you do it? First of all, you put the numbers in. You want it to be E over M. If you change uh, it around, Q is basically E. Yeah, Q is E. Put M on the other side of the equation. You should be able to show that E over M must be equal to V over BR. Once you've got the numbers in, I'm going to just, I'm not going to have time to write them all out because we're already at 29 minutes. Calculate the values given for V from before, B and R from the experiment. So we know the V from before, we know the B from before, and we know the R that's given to us, the B from above, and R that's given to us here. Just make sure you change it to SI units. Yeah? Get a value from the experiment. So you calculate with E and M for the electron. Yeah, you then do this for the data. What is the actual electron 
uh, divided the electron charge by the electron mass. That's the theory value, and then you compare the two values together. So if you do that, the first method will give you a value of e to m of 1.65 times 10 to the power of 11 coulombs per kilogram. And the theoretical value from this method gives you a value of 1.7, that's just dividing 1.6 times 10 to the minus 9 by 9.11 times 10 to the minus 13. It gives you a value of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. So you compare this value with the experiment value and then you, you give your conclusion. Okay, as long as your conclusion is valid, they will give you the third mark. So it's about 10% difference, I think, with a quick calculation, uh, or less than 10% even. So once you do that, you can say that it could be due to whatever uh, reasons. As long as you got the comparison made, you will be able to, to work out the percentage difference and so on. That's what they want you to be able to do, which is kind of the kind of skills that you practiced in Unit 3, and you will be examined on in Unit 6 at the end of the course. Well, I hope you found that useful. The, the end of the papers are always longer questions. Um, we will be doing other papers in the future. Uh, like and share as usual so we get uh, a bigger following. And um, if you subscribe, you'll see when we have produced another exam paper in uh, this method. Hope you found it useful. Um, and it wasn't too confusing for you. Thank you very much for uh, watching till the end.